Hey everybody, welcome to All Team Academy. I am your host, Zach Peterson, and today we are gonna be looking at a viewer question on our most recent impedance calculator video. Zafara Kuhn writes, Hello Zach, I have a question about impedance in Altium. You know that we can calculate the impedance in the layer stack manager, and then from the rules, we can assign this impedance value to some signals as 100 ohm. I'm gonna assume that's differential impedance. However, when we use the signal integrity simulation in Altium, we always see the signals are 200 to 250 ohms, even though we define 100 ohm. It is not possible. So this question is asking if this is a bug, if this is intentional, or I think what's being implied here is, is there something that was done wrong in the PCB layout? So in this particular video, what we're gonna look at is how to extract the real impedance value from your interconnects using the signal integrity tool in Altium Designer, but also why you might see that particular error. So grab your copy of Altium Designer, follow along, and let's get started. Okay, so I'm back inside of my project that has a lot of differential pairs. It's also got some SPI signals on it. And we have some uh, routes going from this big connector over to this chip, and then from the output over to this other connector up here on the top side of the board. Now, this connector is located on the opposite side, and then we've got our chip on the top side. So the question here is, what is the impedance tool, uh, or the uh, signal integrity tool, I should say, actually simulating or calculating when it extracts the impedance of any of these nets? You can extract the impedance, and I'll show you where that option is inside the signal integrity tool, but I also want to explain what it's actually calculating, and that's something that's really important to note, because it's gonna give you a number, and that number might not match what you expect for several different reasons. First, uh, to set up a simulation with this particular type of board where you've basically got two connectors and then an integrated circuit, what you would wanna do is first go into the signal integrity tool and then assign some models. So just go to the tools menu, select signal integrity. You'll see the model assignments error come up. Just click that. And then um, we care about one particular integrated circuit, which is uh, U4. We're just gonna force that to update in the schematic. Here on these connectors, you know, connectors don't normally have a model assigned to them unless you're looking at like S parameters, um, but they don't have like an active electrical model. So what I'm actually gonna do is I'm just gonna fudge it for this simulation. And I'm gonna tell the uh, system in Altium Designer that just for the moment, this is actually an integrated circuit. And so you can imagine this as essentially being like connected to an integrated circuit on the other side of this connector. So I'm just gonna do that for the purposes of running this simulation. And then we'll update those models. And then let's go ahead and analyze the design. Okay, so once it's done, this window pops up and um, you can see all our nets listed here. We've got a lot of data here. We've got our rise time and everything like this. Um, we've got some a little bit of overshoot data here as well. So um, what we care about here is to look at, uh, in particular, these differential nets. And um, I believe the question was referencing something with differential nets or possibly like with uh, single-ended nets, kind of like this, where we have uh, these strongly coupled nets coming in uh, to this particular component and then going off to this other connector. Let's say I want to extract the impedance of uh, this particular differential pair. So this pr particular differential pair, you can tell it's a differential pair because I have the positive and the negative both denoted here. Now, um, if I go over to menu and then show hide columns, there's an option for impedance. I just click it and then you can see right here what the calculated impedance is. And it shows you right here, it's in ohms. It actually does it for all of the nets that are in this list and all the way up here into these other nets as well uh, for uh, CSI group number two. For AWR1 CSI2, this particular net, we can see that the single ended impedance of each of these lines extracted from this solver is 65 ohms. So is that on target? Is that what we would expect for a single-ended impedance? Is that based on coupling to the other pair? Well, first, let's look at what the, the uh, simulation is actually telling you about the impedance. So for that, we have to go into the documentation. So if we look in the documentation, you'll see right here under the uh, signal integrity panel uh, page, that there's an entry here for impedance. 
The impedance is the average impedance for the entire net, so for the entire length of that net, and it's the average of each track segment weighted by its length. So this is a weighted average, and if you're not familiar with what a weighted average is, um, you can read up the definition on Wikipedia. It's actually really simple. It's basically the impedance of each track length multiplied by the length, add all of those segments up, divide by the total length, that gives you the average impedance. Okay, that's the weighted average. That's what it's calculating here. Essentially what that means is that if just one of these segments is long enough and has high impedance, it could throw off this reading here and give you a high average because it's weighted strongly to that particular high impedance portion of that interconnect. So that's what's going on here. Now let's compare with what we would expect to see from, let's say, the layer stack manager. So if I go into the layer stack manager real quick, and then I open up the impedance tool in the layer stack manager, the impedance tool is actually calculating something different. What the impedance tool is calculating is an ideal situation for different types of single or differential geometries. So here in this case, with this differential geometry, it's calculating the width and spacing that give this particular impedance. So you can see here it's 101 ohms, that's the differential impedance. The odd mode impedance of just one of the traces in those pairs would be half of this, so 50 and a half ohms approximately. Now if I go over to this single-ended profile, now this single-ended profile has a target impedance listed here of 60 ohms. So we were actually targeting 50, but the weight that is list or the uh, width that is listed here gives us an impedance value of 60.37. Now let's just suppose for a moment that I take this width. So this is the width that's in one of the traces in the differential pair, and I set that as the width of a single-ended trace. Well, the first thing that you're going to see is number 1, the impedance of that trace is already higher. You can see that right here. So the impedance of the single-ended trace in isolation from anything else is going to be larger than the same trace in a differential pair. So the differential pair always lowers the impedance a little bit. Then you can see here that it's actually about 61.25. That's the impedance of uh, this, particular, uh, this particular trace. Uh, that has a width of 6.315. Let's take a look back inside the PCB layout and let's compare these sets of nets here and see if we can determine why exactly we're seeing this deviation between this group of nets here with 60 ohms impedance and then this group of nets here with 65 ohm impedance. So these were the nets that we initially looked at with 65 ohm impedance. These ones are on the same layer and then they have 60 ohms impedance. So here, if I go back into the PCB layout, we've got one set of differential pairs down here that then go into these vias and go into an internal layer. And so the net that we were looking at in particular is right here, and it all stays on the top layer. Let's remember, first of all, that this is doing a weighted average impedance. So what that means is that for these nets on the bottom half of this connector, if we zoom in here, these sets of nets that come into these vias and then go on to layer three, it's actually doing an average of the impedance between what's happening on this layer and then what's happening on the top layer. So it's basically averaging those impedances together. And what that's doing is it's causing that impedance of this uh, combined net to appear slightly lower or different than the impedance that's actually shown up here where everything is on the top layer. So that's one of the reasons that you get the deviation between these two nets, uh, or these two groups of nets, even though they're basically designed exactly the same. So that's an important thing to note. Where your routing matters because the impedances could be slightly different on different layers. As a result, you would then have the average impedance of just one of those tracks when it does a layer transition to appear different from the average impedance of just one of those tracks when it's on just one layer. So, the next thing to note is that because this is an average, it doesn't actually tell you where in the PCB layout you have the high impedance air, uh, region versus the low impedance region. Now, that's where you've got to go back into the layer stack manager and you've got to do a little bit of configuring um, and a little bit of trial and error in order to determine 
which of these sections is the high impedance section and which of these sections would be the lower impedance section. So in this particular example where we've been playing with this and doing some adjustments to the differential pair width, we actually would find that this particular net right here is the lower impedance section. And that's what causes the uh, total impedance of this average to then average out to a smaller value. I think another important point that this brings up here is how the spacing affects the impedance of these individual traces. Now, at moderate speed, this might not matter so much. At very high speed where you have fast edge rates, it will matter a lot because you'll start to see more power being reflected at high frequencies. So what this tool is actually showing us is that we may wanna actually space these out a bit because if in, in the previous uh, example with this particular layout, which we did, we uh, found that we needed to increase the width of these traces just a little bit in order to hit a differential impedance target. So when I increased the width of those traces, I was doing that so that I didn't have to actually reroute anything. And the reason for that is it's actually a lot easier to just make that width adjustment so that you don't have to do a bunch of rerouting. So in this particular board, I mean, there's 10 differential pairs. That's a decent amount of rerouting. But imagine that you had multiple CSI lanes, LVDS lanes, some other lanes, let's say it's an ether, it's got ethernet on it, so then you've got to do ethernet as well. That's a lot of rerouting. So sometimes it's easier to just do the quick and dirty thing, increase the, the width of just a little bit, that decreases the spacing just a little bit, and then you can dial that differential impedance and thus the odd mode impedance in to, the, to just the right value. In terms of very high frequency signal integrity, the better option would have been to space out those traces a bit more as well as increase the width. So in this particular hypothetical instance, we were saying we were stuck with a specific substrate thickness. And so that limits us in what we can do. But an even better option here would be to actually decrease that substrate thickness and then we wouldn't necessarily have to widen the traces so much in order to hit that impedance target. So this is some of the stuff that the impedance tool reveals to us, and it doesn't show us uh, broken out by length along the entire length of the trace. However, as you scan through these different regions of this differential pair, you can start to pick out where the impedances are different and then target those specific areas for change. So how you route will also affect the impedance. Just as an example, let's say you were routing inside copper pore and that copper pore was very close to your traces. The second you leave that copper pore, that section of the trace that's outside of that copper pore is now gonna have higher impedance. So keep that in mind because things like that or things like, I don't know, routing over a gap in a ground plane or routing where there's no ground at all, that's going to increase the impedance and that will push up that weighted average value that you see from a tool just like the signal integrity tool in Altium Designer. So I know we've gone over this tool in the past, but we haven't gone over this particular feature and the types of comparisons that you might need to make to the ideal calculation in the layer stack manager. Just remember, the layer stack manager calculation is ideal. It's not considering anything that might be happening around that trace or around that transmission line in your PCB layout. Once you get into your actual PCB layout and you're looking in the signal integrity tool, that tool is being used to evaluate the real structure of your PCB, which could have all sorts of different parasitics around it that then create an impedance deviation. So keep these points in mind. They are very important for understanding what this signal integrity tool is actually doing. All right, thanks everybody for watching this. Uh, make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, leave your comments and questions in the comments section. Don't forget, send your questions off to YouTube at altium.com. We're gonna be doing a Q&A video soon and we love getting your comments and questions. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.